Hello everyone, my name is John Rakic and welcome to the 10th annual Location Manager's Guild International panel on the Hollywood Location Scouts here at Comic-Con International. It's good to be back in person. Whether it's actual on-location filming or just going out with the visual effects artists to get the footage and photogrammetry that goes into green screens and LED screen stages, we are the people that work closely with the directors and production designers to find all of the real-world locations in movies, TV shows, and other media. From every mansion to every shack, every skyscraper, every bunker, tunnel, someone had to be the first person to go out and find those places. All over the world, location scouts are either based there or they travel afar. They could be non-union, Teamster, Directors Guild, IATSE, or others. Some are members of the Motion Picture Academy, and as of this year, we're also members of the Television Academy, which is a big step for us. Before we get too far, let's start things off with a quick sizzle reel that showcases the work of our panelists here, with transitions between our original scout photos and final scenes of the movies and TV shows that we've worked on. to acknowledge the companies that sponsored our guild's participation here. Uh, the Big Bear Lake Film Office assists filmmakers with permitting and location needs while filming at Big Bear Lake in Southern California. The Directors Guild of Canada, Ontario, is a labor organization with over 3,000 members that includes location managers, production designers, and directors. The Imperial County Film Commission assists with production in finding and securing locations and is the permitting agent for finding on-city and county-owned properties. Inland Empire Film Services, uh, assists with city, county, and federal film permits in San Bernardino and Riverside Counties, California. 
The Riverside County Film Commission helps film productions to finding lo filming locations and local vendors within the country, county. The Temecula Film Office assists film productions with permits and location needs in and around the city of Temecula, California. And White's Location Equipment Supply is a Canadian national supplier of production, rental gear, and location support. Our past panels have featured many location managers and members of the Location Managers Guild International from all over the world. And this time again, we have international representation from both coasts of Canada, New York City, Atlanta, and Los Angeles. We're going to get to go down the uh, table with some brief introductions to who we each are and how we got into this line of work. I'll begin. I'm from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I've been working in <laughs> locations for over 20 years. I uh, started off as an office assistant and fell my way into locations as a scout and now a manager. Uh, I've worked on TV shows and movies, uh, most of the Resident Evil franchises, Pixels, Shadowhunters, uh, American Gods, and currently the last two seasons of C for Apple TV+. Uh, I also am the current president of the Location Managers Guild International. Um. Hi, my name is Shasta Kenny Fortin. Um, I started working in LA in locations about seven years ago. Um, I've worked on lots of different TV shows, mostly Perry Mason and this recent Perry Mason, Snowfall, American Horror Story, La La Land, um, just a lot of fun in the last seven years. Um, but that's what I do and who I am. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Mike Bonanno. I'm from New York. Uh, my start in this business is interesting. I actually was working at a pizza restaurant with my buddy uh, who went to school for film. And he discovered an application online for a reality show. And he told me I should apply for it. And I ended up becoming a cast member on uh, an MTV dating show called The Shot at Love with Tila Tequila. Uh, we are so lucky. But I realized that I wanted to get into the, the business. So uh, when that show finished, um, my buddy, who got me to, uh, and I should say his name, Mike Murray, who got me to uh, apply for that show, he ended up getting me a job uh, as a location production assistant. Uh, on a uh, Showtime series, just picking up trash, cleaning the bathrooms, putting signs up, and I loved it. I got my own van, I have toiletries, uh, garbage bags, everything I got to bring home when we use it. Uh, and I just kind of uh, segued that uh, through the ranks of location assisting to ALMing. I moved to New York uh, in 2012 to do Boardwalk Empire. Uh, I've done a couple Avengers, New York units, Spider Man, um, Hawkeye. You saw the sizzle reel severance, so I've been very fortunate uh, that I went from reality TV to being here at San Diego Comic Con. So, very, very uh, thankful for that. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Nolan. I am also from Canada, like John, a uh, little west side. I always kind of knew I wanted to be in the industry. It's kind of, it's not like everyone else. Um, they kind of fall into it. Just growing up as a kid, I was into all those 80s movies and uh, just always wondered how they did it. So when I was 19, I went, uh, hopped in my car, moved out to Vancouver and uh, just started begging for work. Started to get some work right away as a PA and uh, ended up working up the ladder quite quickly and done quite a few films. I ended up in Alberta after five or six years and uh, just never left. Um, I've always stayed. And a couple weeks ago, John called me to ask me to come to Comic Con. So, you're in. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, Zachary Quimore. I'm uh, actually originally from Philadelphia. And uh, I started in this industry because I was watching traffic cones uh, at night while I was going to college because uh, no one listens to parking signs in Philadelphia. So, you have to have someone sitting there waiting for the trucks to arrive. Um, I didn't know what a locations department was on a movie, uh, but being in the parking uh, department, that falls underneath the locations. Um, so I fell in love with it. Uh, also worked my way up through the ranks. Uh, ended up moving to Los Angeles after working on Dark Knight Rises. Uh, been there ever since. Uh, traveled the world uh, making movies. It's kind of amazing. And I actually met my wife uh, in Moab, Utah on Transformers 4. She was the, um, the manager of the hotel that I stayed at, so. Uh, yeah. I didn't know. <laughs>
Um, hey there, um, my name is Julieta Rey del Castillo and I am based in Atlanta. I am a key assistant location manager in Scout. Been doing this for a little over 11 years. Um, I think I always knew that I wanted to work in film, but growing up, you basically know that there's three positions, which is you're in front of the camera as an actor, you're a director, or you work the camera. And so that's what I grew up thinking I wanted to do until I got my shot when I was 15 on a music video and I was in front of the camera and then I realized it was not for me. It was way cooler from behind the scenes, standing behind the camera, watching the setups. And that was the day that I decided that I was gonna do film, I was gonna work in television, I was gonna do all of it, but I wanted to do behind the scenes. And so I've got, got a few Marvel credits up my sleeve. Um, I actually started in features, did Rock of Ages, Pain and Gain, moved my way into episodic. I did five years on the originals. I did Black Lightning, I did Stargirl. Um, got my big, big break on Suicide Squad. And that was a lot of fun because I got to basically handle everything that was second unit. So I did all the stunt work for it, like the big car crashes that you see, which was my dream job. Uh, and then after that, I went on and I did Miss Marvel. Um, which just, uh, I think the finale came out last week and it's doing really great and it was a great show to work on. And I just wrapped uh, Black Panther Wakanda Forever. So you'll find most of us never knew what we wanted to do and most people in locations come from every other aspect. We kind of fall into it, fall in love with it, stick with it. Um, so Shasta, please give everyone yes. a summary of what it is that we do exactly. What's the location scouting process mm -hmm. and what do we do during each of the stages of uh, prep, filming, and wrap? Okay, so it starts with the script. You get a script, you read it, um, and then while we're reading it, we build a list of all the locations that are in there. And once we have that list, we go out and we scout for them. We find as many options as we can. We photograph them, we document them. And the creative team, the director, the, the designer will then give their input, narrow it down until they choose a location. Once that's done, the real work starts. So we have to do a contract with each of those locations. We need to get the permits for whatever jurisdiction they're in to be able to do the filming with that location. Um, and then we do all of the support. So when, when we're not filming on a lot, we need to have all the auxiliary support systems on location for our crew to be able to do their jobs. That's toilets, that's AC and heating, it's rain cover, it's parking, it's areas for for all of our BG processing. It's, it's very different per location, per day, per show, per everything is exactly different every single time. You might film at the same place 12 different times and your needs will change every time because of the specific activities you're doing, um, whether it's gunfire or a pool scene or rivers or a rooftop, there's sort of a formula where we're still going to need certain things and then each show, each moment will need its, its particular other specificities. Uh, and then once it's all done, once the party comes to town and we finish all our filming, it's also our job to make sure we put it back the way we found it. Um, so that's also a lot of our vendors coming in and doing cleaning and repairs or um, any last minute fixes that might need to happen to make sure we leave it the way we found it. And while we're present, we're also sort of an in-between person. We're the first person that your neighborhood might meet if we come to film in your neighborhood. You're gonna get to know my face, you're gonna know who to come ask questions to or bring complaints to. That's us and we help navigate all of that and we also help production get what they need while we're filming as guests um, at any location that we are at. So that's the sum of, <laughs> generically, um, what the job is. So Michael, you've been able to work on some high profile uh, franchise films. What are some of the additional challenges on projects like that that are so much bigger in scope and scale? So, um, I feel like you have more time when you're doing movies than TV shows. So, uh, the pressure to deliver uh, some great options to the directors and production designer isn't there at the beginning, like when you're doing episodic, you only have two days to find like this hero location. But for something like uh, Spider-Man, which was the third Spider-Man franchise to come to New York. And there's a long list of amazing location managers that had, had done that. So it was a big, like, uh, there's a lot of pressure I, I felt because I wanted to do a great job. It, I felt like there's a small niche of people that have done it before me. And it was interesting because they had shot in Prolong and uh, uh, Venice and London. 
while I was scouting for the New York bits, and I had never had any. We didn't have. We didn't do Zoom then, so it would just be scouting locations, sending those photos to John Watts and his assistant, and they would just pick from the photos, hoping that when they arrived and see it in person, it'll be a go. And what was interesting is sometimes we'll get a previs, which is from the visual effects department, which is like an animated version of the movie that's going to show you what the final shots are going to be. So the scene at Madison Square Garden was originally just Spider-Man and MJ walking down the sidewalk. That was fine. It was just a walk and talk scene, nothing crazy. So uh, they arrived from uh, Venice, I think, on a Tuesday. We went from the airport to look at Madison Square Garden. We were scheduled to shoot it that Friday, so three days. I talked to 14 different agencies about this. There was uh, Penn Station, Madison Square Garden, uh, the MTA, the Long Island Railroad, uh, the police, the mayor's office. And everybody was on the same page, walk and talk scene, Spider-Man in an outfit. We're gonna shoot it Friday during rush hour. We're gonna have a lot of like looky loos and paparazzi, but we'll deal with it. So we get there, John Watts says, you know what, we should have him swing in, holding Zendaya, we're going to need a bait crane. We're going to need to like shut down 33rd Street. And I'm just like, all right, I, I don't want to ever say no. And uh, it's it's our job to try oh, as like whatever we can do to make it happen. So that next day at six in the morning, I had to go talk to Penn Station because they they had escalators being delivered uh, the morning we were shooting. And it's right where we wanted to put a bay crane because everywhere else on that corner, the street wasn't strong enough for it because the subway was right below. And I don't want you know, anything awful to happen. So uh, we ended up putting some of the construction people in the movie. Uh, and, and we pulled it off and you know, you look around at uh, James Foley, like the iconic mail office that's there, it has those those giant stairs, there's like hundreds of fans, excited, Tom Holland's waving to everybody. And I like, I go to the producer, I'm like, how did you guys pull this off in London and everywhere? He's like, oh, we didn't do this in London. We did everything on a back lot there. This is the first time we've done this in, in the real world. <laughs> and it was the first time they were gonna reveal his new suit that they knew was gonna get out online. Like it was like a huge publicity thing. So, uh, that was fun. I, I, I don't think that's kind of what you asked me, but I, I, veered, off. I veered off there. But, um, you know, there's a pressure. Uh, there's always a pressure, whether it's TV and movies. And I think in movies, it's hard to tell the director no. So you really got to do things out of the ordinary to, to deliver. So that's, that's, that's a little bit. Of that's fun. great. So Jason, you're based in Alberta, Canada, and much like yes. with me based in Toronto, we're working on projects that take place in other cities around the world and rarely actually in our own. Um, so what are your experiences working with, our American, with American film projects, and uh, how do you go about with your scouting methods for finding locations that cheat other cities around the world? Uh, wow. Well, uh, yeah, the majority of the projects I do work on uh, or we have there are American. And geographically where I'm kind of located is nice because where the city is, you just go, you go about 20, 30 minutes east and you're getting into some nice prairie and then a few more minutes you're into the Badlands, which goes on and on and on. Um, you go south, you get nice little small town America, some rolling hills, you're in the foothills. You go a little further and you kind of reach where the, the Rockies come right down to the plains. Um, and there's some beautiful lakes right on the border of Montana. And west, I mean, you don't have to go very far west to get into the Rocky Mountains. So I mean, that's typically where I spend the majority of my days. Um, we do a lot of films that take place in Alaska, um, such as like Born Legacy, um, a lot of Midwest through Montana, Idaho, that kind of feel, um, which we did for uh, the Revenant, um, quite a, like, there's a lot of landscape stuff. Um, and typically when, or small town America, so when I get a script from a studio or a producer and they first send it to me, um, it's important, you know, I give it a read and I find out where, where is this taking place in, in our world. The internet's the best, it's a great place. I mean, you do the research of what, what's this little town they wrote in Montana or Oklahoma. And, is it real? Is it fictional? You know, if it's fictional, what's the best representation? Because uh, often I, you know, I'm getting this before there just, there's even a designer on the board. Or if there is a designer on the board, they'll they'll give us a, you know, they'll do like a mood board, little samples of 
images, you know, feel for home or the main street or um, the type of river or mountaintop they're looking for. Uh, and then, you know, I just do my best to kind of break it down that way and give them represented in a way so they can feel that the story could be shot um, where we are. So, perfect. So Zach, much like myself, you've worked on both movies and TV shows. In terms of our work as location professionals, what's the difference in which do you tend to prefer? Oh, wow. That's a loaded question because I'm uh, working on Episodic right now, but uh, I would say I generally lean towards features. Um, and the difference, I would say, um, I mean, there's a lot of differences. Um, usually TV is a lot more fast uh, faster pace. You're scouting while you're shooting the other episodes. There's a lot more reoccurring locations that you have to deal with. So you're in these neighborhoods and at these locations, you know, throughout an entire season. So you kind of have to maintain these locations, whereas, you know, uh, features that usually you can shoot out of order. So you can shoot out a location and that way you can wrap it. And I would say, you know, like he was saying, uh, with features, you have the time, you have the money, uh, so you can't say no, and it's, it better be perfect. Um, and TV should be perfect as well. Um, but you're, you're moving a lot quicker, your footprint's smaller, so you can kind of, uh, you know, come in and out a whole lot easier. So, uh, so Julieta, since you're based out of Atlanta, for the audience out there who doesn't live in LA or New York, uh, do you have any recommendations for how to get into a, uh, a career in film closer to their own home? Um, so I'm actually pretty glad I got this question. So a little, a little background. Um, I was actually born in Argentina. I came to the States when I was five with my parents and my three brothers. And so English was a second language for me. And growing up, I knew that I always wanted to work in film, so I I did anything and everything I could to take any course in school, any, you know, after school specials, every, anything in the morning, like in elementary school, we had a little morning news segment and I wanted to try out every single department that I could. So we had like a little, you know, we had a camera, it was a live feed. Sometimes you had to run, you know, the programming for it or you've got to be the host. And I was all about it, I loved it. Um, got into high school and took film classes throughout there. And uh, I did not go to college, but after high school, I lived in a small town called Valdosta, which is uh, basically South Georgia. And in high school, I taught myself how to edit. And that's what I thought that I really wanted to do. And I reached out to a local production company, really small thing, only, they only did like videos for the Chamber of Commerce, some for the local hospital, you know, some like the local commercials that you get like on, you know, PBS, things like that. Um, and I reached out and I said, look, I'd love to intern. I'd love to shadow. I'd love to, you know, listen in. I just want to be a part of it. And he asked me if I knew how to edit. And I said, yes. And I got a job. And so I edited for, it was about a year. And then I realized that I didn't love editing as much as I love doing it for fun. Um, and then that's when I ended up getting into the locations department. Um, basically, all you need is someone to give you one shot. That's it. Um, it's just an opportunity. So if you, social media is such a big platform these days that even if you start following, you know, the location manager guild or any of us on, on Instagram, and even if you message us and say, hey, look, you know, we're in town, like I'm in Atlanta, I'd love to meet up, grab a coffee, I'd love to hear more about your work and you know what you do and how you got in or you know any advice that you may have, do it. I mean, there's no shame in it. I have reached out to producers, I have reached out to other location managers. Um, it's, it's all about somebody giving you, giving you a chance, but there's so many resources these days. Like in Georgia specifically, there is the Georgia Film Academy and it pairs with all of the big major colleges out there that have film programs. And so there are courses that you can sign up and you take and, you know, like it's usually people that do it straight out of high school. They go in, they learn a little bit about what it takes to be a grip, electrician, camera, a little bit about every single position. And then at the end of the internship, or I'm sorry, at the end of the, um, the courses, they get an internship and they get placed on a show. And I have actually hired multiple location assistants from that program. Um, actually on Panther, we had three of them that started on that program and they came in, they were paid internships. They did their internship and about, they do it for, it's a couple of weeks. And then after, at the end of it, nine times out of 10, they get offered a job and that's exactly what we did. And so they got to finish Panther with, 
you know, that on their, on their resume. Um, and then two of them actually transitioned into the departments that they really wanted to work in, which were props. And um, one of my other guys just got into the uh, camera union and is now working in the camera department on a different show. So just do your research. There's, whether it's the film office or the chamber of commerce or economic development, there's always something that's video, TV, commercial, film related that you can reach out to and say, you know, I, this is what, something I'd like to get into. Do you have any leads? And they'll put you in contact with someone. And whether it's you go and you shadow, then that's a way to start. That's my final answer. <laughs> so Shasta, you started out working on non-union and low-budget projects. Yeah. Um, your local union in LA is Teamsters 399. Um, most of us all belong to some sort of collective labor union, uh, different versions of them. Uh, tell us about making the transition and what it meant for you personally and professionally. And then what about joining the Location Managers Guild International? Ah, okay. So I'll go in order. I actually joined the LMGA uh, before it was the so LMGI. Nice. Um, before I was in the union. So I was non-union and trying to basically do exactly what Julieta was just saying about like rubbing shoulders with other managers and kind of dropping hints that I'd like to get into the cool club. Um, that's when I kind of got into the LMGA and I have not left. Um, and then as far as switching from non-union to union, what it meant Oh, everything. So personally, it meant the difference between living in my car to having a roof over my head. <laughs> that was very good. Um, and then professionally, it opens up such a world of possibilities because um, a union show, no matter what side of the country or other country you're in, is um, pretty much most of the movies that you recognize and the TV shows that you know. So working on on non-union projects, lower budget films, um, music videos, commercials, things like that in the non-union world, it's it's such a sliver of the whole of all of the work that there is. So joining a union and getting in was just busting that door wide open. Um, and then the more you work, the more you meet other people on your team and then word of mouth gets around and you keep getting more work. and. Yeah, there's night and day. I haven't left. <laughs> Good. So, Michael, obviously being in New York, you face a lot of challenges due to the extreme traffic and lack of street parking, or trying to put a crane in the, over the subway and not having it collapse. <laughs> um, what are your solutions to these kinds of issues, and what are the, some of the other challenges working in somewhere like New York? Uh, okay, so when I first started, I was in Rhode Island, and then we went to Boston, and you know, we park everything in parking lots there, which is very convenient. They don't exist in the city in New York. So during the pandemic, you know, the city allowed restaurants to do outdoor dining. And uh, it's it was great for the businesses to be able to stay open. It definitely had an impact on all the residential areas. So people were, were losing parking. And then Hawkeye came to town and we had 20 campers that we needed to park in these small neighborhoods in the Lower East Side and in Midtown. And there were rules now with open streets for uh, COVID and outdoor dining where you can't, you couldn't park near these restaurants anymore. So we literally would be taking 10 blocks of parking for two actors. And it's really hard to justify that. So <laughs> COVID helped us a little bit. You know, not a lot of people were out, not a lot of people were going to work, so we would really take a lot of uh, business parking instead of residential parking. But it's definitely challenging. Uh, every, any given day in New York, the mayor's office is permitting about three to four miles of parking for all the productions that are there. You get, and what we have to do, what we can advance is post notice on every street pole and, uh, you know, telephone pole with our name and our cell phone number as the manager. So the residents can call you and say, so are you going to pay for 100 people to park in a garage on Tuesday next week? Because where are we supposed to go? There's no parking here. It's not fun to have those conversations, but the loophole, I guess, is like when you do it in Boston, you have to pay for all those residents to park somewhere else because they pay for parking in their neighborhoods in Charlestown or wherever. In the city, they don't have to pay for parking. So the mayor's office looks at it as like, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a privilege if you're able to find a parking spot in front of your house or your apartment. 
but this is kind of the deal. There's filming all over the place in New York. We fill out a, an application at the beginning of every job. We, we do the right thing by notifying everybody, hopefully a week in advance. Schedule changes really hurt because then you're struggling to get cars moved to park, you know, campers and the equipment trucks. But uh, you'll always get crew members complaining, like, why is the prop truck further than the grip truck? Why is catering so far away today? It's, it's just, it, it's finding that balance between the real world and the production world and trying to keep everybody happy. It's, 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 it's our job and it's, if you, if you do it right and you're organized and really good at communicating with the neighborhoods, like, they appreciate it. Like, as much as it's not fun for them to have to find parking, at least they're like, well, you told me last week, so I can't really say anything. But there are some productions that maybe don't give as much notice, and that's, that's when we, we have to, like, help fix those neighborhoods when we come in. So, uh, yeah. It's also the fine line between production and creative, which is... Yeah, question I have yeah. for Jason is on, on Ghostbusters Afterlife, you've dealt with a lot of major set builds, especially in the, the farmhouse. Obviously the production designer and the art department design and build these, but what's it like for you to find the places um, to build these sets? This might take a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you all seen Afterlife? Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess I'll kind of start with spinners. Uh, it was. Jason had a really um, specific image in his mind for what that diner and the feel of that location um, was to represent in the film. Um, and it was also kind of like a connecting piece for our Munter, Munter chase. The pl placement of it was kind of like in the edge of town, sort of going to the mine and coming back to the mine, and traveling through Somerville. So we had hunted um, far and wide, long and hard. Uh, we have a few American style diners like that, but none of them were in the correct place. In the middle of the city, just didn't have, you know, the surroundings just weren't right. Um, and then, so I found this old, it's kind of like mechanic shop slash gas station uh, that had been abandoned for a while uh, in this small town just north of Calgary. And it was taking a little bit to get a hold of the owners of the property They kind of kind of got little MIA for a while so it was something that was kind of holding in the back of my pocket for a bit and didn't want to present because you don't want to show a director something and have them fall in love with it and they can't have it but it all worked out really well able to do a deal um, Francois designer I mean we did quite a bit of work to the place to transform it to make it look like it did adding the awnings out and all the lighting um, and it was a full build interior and exterior, so we shot everything on location there. That was, that was very important uh, to them. And it was a nice connecting piece, but with that, um, the town of Somerville, instead of one small town, actually became four small towns. So hopefully you don't notice when you watch the film that uh, you know turning this corner or that corner is actually a different, different location within the province. So. And the barn and the hops. So, again, very specific um, look they were after with the farmhouse and the barn and its proximity and the feel around the surrounding areas. We do have a few houses like that, um, farmhouses like that in there, but they're very much in better condition than what you see in the movie. So right off the bat, we kind of decided to be looking for a place that had a really great barn um, no longer a farmhouse around it where we could build, build the house um, to go with the barn and have it situated properly. We found this great barn, um, as you see in the film. It ended up being a little too far away for um, our work with the cast. So some of our cast are minors and they work much shorter days than we do. So we were off. We weren't able to shoot there. With this, with this great barn and, and do the set. So we ended up finding the perfect place, um, vacant piece of land. We then then negotiated to purchase this barn from the farmer um, who owned it. Construction came in, disassembled it, and then reassembled it on location in the middle of the field. And it looks identical. <laughs> like you can't, you can't tell. I couldn't, believe, I couldn't believe they actually did this. Um, so we were able to, it was nice starting, it's always nice starting with a fresh, fresh um, 
set as well because you know it gives the chance for the director of photography and stuff especially you know to position things right for the lights and and orientate the action you can make the driveway wherever you want um, you know leading out to the street and that um, and also a little bit with that barn when we were off um, filming some very fun other things they disassembled it one more time and then rebuilt it in the studio so, it's always it's always nice to have something to work from, um, but in some cases you have nothing, um, and you got to start from scratch. So, yeah. all right. So one of the great things about our jobs is getting opportunities to see unusual places. What are some of the most adventurous or simply unique places that you've been able to see, and what are some of the truly wonderful things about the work that we do? Start down at the end, Julia. Oh boy, <laughs> I was not ready for this question. Ah. Um, Man, I've shot in some really cool places. Um, I, don't, I can't talk about this one that I really want to answer. Uh, I, we filmed in, in Puerto Rico, um, and that was one of the coolest places, but obviously it came with, with its challenges because island time is a very real term, and all of the resources that I'm used to having in the States, we did not have uh, available on the island in the time that we needed it. So logistically, it was... It was not an ideal situation, but we made it work. Um, I've gotten to film in Boston. I've gotten to film in smaller towns in Massachusetts that we are not allowed to talk about. On the originals, we had the opportunity to film in an abandoned insane asylum that was owned by the state, and we were the only show that had been allowed in there. Um, so the preparation for that was, was pretty interesting because we, the director had to go in. They had to choose the rooms that they wanted to see on camera and so let's say we chose four rooms that we wanted to see on camera. Well, you'd have to clear out rooms on either side, rooms across the hall. So you're looking at what was, I think, fifty or $60,000 abatement job between the lead paint and you know all the mold on the walls. But it looked fantastic. Um, it looked really, really great. But there was no power. There was no water. So you have to bring in all of those. Uh, yeah, you had to bring in generators, you had to bring in lights. We had to install uh, battery lights in all of the stairwells. It was in the middle of winter, so it was very, very, very cold. But you can't heat in there because um, I think this was Warner Brothers Safety at the time, didn't want us basically blowing off all of the lead paint that we had removed from the other rooms. Um, but yeah, I'll stick to those three answers so everybody else can answer. Yeah, I, I shot an abandoned power plant once that had no electricity. The irony of having to bring in power. Um, Zach, same question. Um, I, I've actually been lucky to travel pretty much all over the world, just as Julieta has. Um, I've shot in Vietnam, um, Australia, uh, North, uh, sorry, South Korea, um, uh, China, um, Detroit, which is not international, but pretty much is. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I've been blessed to kind of be able to go all over the world, scout different locations and everything like that. And I've shot some really cool places. Uh, we shot at Edwards Air Force Base. If anyone knows, that's where they test all the uh, new planes. So that was cool. Uh, we shot at the GM testing grounds uh, where they test all the new cars. Um, I've been in uh, some crazy places. So, yeah. Jason? Question? Same question. Um, I, I have to say it's kind of weird, but uh, my own backyard. Um, I love working in the mountains and having the challenge of getting up nine, ten thousand feet and figuring out how the crew is going to get there, uh, the logistics involved. Um, scouting the mountains is something else. I mean, I spent a lot of days in a helicopter. and. Honestly, there's nothing better than, you know, flying around the director all day and looking for the right ridge top and hey, like, that looks pretty good. Let's sort of, can we touch down there? And uh, next thing you know, you're touching down on the, the top of a mountain or, you know, an area of a glacier and you're standing there and you're thinking, you know what? There's a pretty good chance that no one else has ever stood here before, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's pretty special. and. Uh, Always, also always opening new doors, new locations, always finding that right thing and um, being the first one. Um, there's a lot of my last project that were first that I can't talk about, but um, yeah, I mean the mount mountains, it's kind of like my ocean, you know, mountains. No place like home. Yeah. Mike? 
Um, yeah, being able to just scout locations that they might not even pick to be in a show or a movie, but it's something that you're able to see that you feel like not a lot of people in the world will ever get to see, like scouting the Empire State Building and then just taking you up to the, sp the spire at the top, which we wouldn't, like, I, I don't know what you would film up there because you can only have one person there. <laughs> uh, that's how they're so small, but to be able to, like, be up there and think about how cool my, like, our jobs are. Uh, scouting, like, Fenway Park, you know. Um, for me, growing up, like, watching Big and Home Alone, Lost in New York, and then being able to work on Hawkeye and shutting down Rockefeller Center uh, overnight was a highlight for me. Uh, we, we owned the rink, we owned the whole plaza, we used Rock, uh, FAO Schwartz just as a holding space to keep <laughs> Jeremy Renner and Haley Steinfeld warm. Like, that was pretty cool. Um, and then also to get permission from them to knock the tree over. We didn't actually do it uh, there. They did that on a back lot in Atlanta, but that was something that they've never agreed to. They don't, they license the tree out to shows and movies, but, and they always say no when you want to do something to it. But they were, they were all about the big finale and them bringing the tree down for that. So that, that's cool, like to be able to say you're part of those conversations and, and then seeing it all come together. So, what was the question again? I'm sorry. Oh. Most adventurous or unique places you've been able to see and some of the wonderful things about the work we get to do. Oh, um, I think my first time working in San Francisco, we were doing a VFX unit and everything was from the rooftops. So I got to know the city from above, from all of these rooftops that we were trying to uh, negotiate for Terminator Genesis. Um, and then in LA, there's so much filming that it is really exciting finding somewhere um, brand new, somewhere that no one has filmed at or getting that yes, like like the Rockefeller tree, like something that they usually say no for and, and being able to really finagle that yes is so satisfying. That's great. So we have about five minutes left for any questions from the audience, if anyone. So are there any locations that are so iconic to a specific film or television show that you don't dare to shoot there? And if so, where? Or what, maybe? It just screams like a New York question, doesn't it? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I was on Severance uh, for five months with Ben Stiller prep, uh, scouting locations, and he uh, is he's very creative and he knows what he wants and he does not want to shoot anywhere that any show has ever shot before. Um, and he really wanted to shoot at the Bell Works building, which is in Holmdel, New Jersey, which is Lumen Industries. And we were, you know, like, like I said, five months out from shooting. And while we were there, like negotiating contracts, there was another TV series that was scouting it. So I had to like, talk to them and our producer discreetly just say we might have another show that shoots here before us and she's like well how much would it cost to not allow any show ever to shoot here and I'm like well it's a $50,000 a day location fee for shooting so I'm sure they're gonna want something like that if we're gonna hold it for five months so we got lucky a pilot did shoot in one of the meeting rooms but they didn't show like the exterior or the security uh, entrance that you see uh, Adam Scott walk through. So that, it's, a, it's a little backwards from what you had asked, uh, but uh, I wouldn't want to bring anything like, you know, Rock Center or Empire State Building or the Chrysler Building to someone like him because, I mean, it's, it's a struggle we all have now. It's nobody wants to shoot anywhere that anyone shot and everyone shot everywhere. So it's really <laughs> hard to show something new. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it. So you have time for one more question. What type of backgrounds are conducive to those who have mentioned Karen and Michael you mentioned negotiating contracts? I'm a lawyer. Um, is that something that would be conducive to us or is it more in a little bit of everything. I, I'm a failed history major that worked in a record store and lived in my parents' basement before I got into film. So. <laughs> it could be anything, really. I mean, we'll all just. What'd y'all go to school for? Quick. 
I, I, I didn't finish community college. I went on, like I said, I was at a restaurant. And I think if you can work in a restaurant, that is like what really builds you up to work in this industry. Because it's just, you're dealing with all types of personalities all the time. And you need to just bite your tongue a lot. You well, know? Yeah. yeah. But we've come from all walks of life. And at the end of the day, to be honest, how many of us probably know more than the studio lawyers we deal with? when it comes to contracts. Uh, yeah. I have no law degree, but I've been asked several times where I went to law school when I've had them change things. Um, whatever background you have is a passion to do what we do, and you kind of take those skills that you, you have and, and make them work. Yeah, like my wife's a coordinator, and she, she deals with our legal studio legal department on a daily basis. So she's not a lawyer, but she understands it really well. So I mean, skills do transfer. But I'm getting the sign from the back that we should wrap this up. So that's about all the time we have for this version of our panel. I'd like to thank the panel for being able to make the trip to come out and be part of this. I'd also like to thank the organizers of Comic-Con for having us come back and be here in person. And I'd like to thank all of you out there for attending. This has been the 10th uh, annual Hollywood Location Scouts Location Manager Field International Challenge. Thank you.